A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are very honoured to welcome our guest of honour, Professor Kenneth Mark, Director of Medical Services, Ministry of Health, Singapore. Gracing this occasion along with him is Dr. Cheong Wei Yang, Deputy Secretary of Technology, Ministry of Health, Singapore. I'm Lavanya, your MC for tonight, and on behalf of my colleagues at CORE, I would like to warmly welcome you to the Alistair Breckenridge Lecture and Graduation Ceremony for our Graduate Certificate in Health Product Regulation. We have 500 participants who have registered virtually to attend this event, and a further over 50 participants present in person here at the Nian Kongsi Auditorium at the Academia Building in the Singapore General Hospital campus. This lecture series commemorates our centre's first chairman, the late Professor Sir Alistair Breckenridge, and is in honour of his visionary and exemplary leadership in steering the centre. The aim of this lecture series is to address and foster dialogue on global biomedical and regulatory issues, challenges and advances. This evening, we are delighted to welcome a leading voice in vaccines development, Dr Penny Heaton, to speak on the topic of successes and opportunities in the pandemic, where she will spotlight the revelations from the global COVID-19 response to help us prepare for future pandemics. We look forward to an informative speech coming up shortly. To commence today's program, we are very pleased to present an abridged version of our commemorative video on the late Professor Sir Alistair Breckenridge to remind us all of the great impact he had on the international regulatory community and to all of us at CORE. Through his achievements and legacy, we hope this video makes a lasting impact on the current and future generations of regulatory science and health professionals. It's an enormous honour to be able to start the lecture series with the inaugural lecture. Alistair's fierce independence, his importance of putting science at the heart of decision making, and his ability and willingness to fight for the corner, for doing the right thing, rather than sometimes doing the politically expedient thing, was an amazing contribution to setting up the values of the MHRA. And those values persist today and have been so important over the last 12 months uh, uh, as we've lived through COVID. Alistair will always hold a very special place in my life. He quickly became a valued colleague, a wonderful mentor, and most importantly, a friend. With that twinkle in his eye and lilt in his voice, he was always teaching. There was so much to learn. What a splendid person. I had the privilege of knowing Alistair for a period of 45 years. And for me, he was probably the closest colleague that I'd ever had. And he was a advisor, mentor, and really somebody that I looked up to. And he came to be a close personal friend. The fact of the matter is, Alastair will never be replaced as far as I'm concerned. And the world is a poorer place without him. Alastair has been, uh, for so many of us, Inspiring for me has been a coach, a teacher, and a friend. I will miss him forever. Sir Alistair was a mentor of generations of regulatory scientists, both in Europe and in the world. I spent many evenings and days debating with him about Brexit, about evidence generation, about St. Andrews, where he studied and my daughter studied. He truly was an inspiration to many of us. One of the things about Sir Alistair is he always approached those with a critical, critical, courteous, but questioning mind about what areas that organisation could have the greatest value for industry, government, for regulators, and most importantly, for patients. So in conclusion, we can carry on our roles and we can continue as Sir Alistair did in questioning the status quo, we can pay appropriate tribute and deference to his memory. 
and I'm sure in that way that his impact and memory will live on. I was very good at drawing out people's opinion actually, in fact he had a habit of calling on people who weren't really speaking up at the meeting and asking them you know, what was their opinion on the particular topic at hand. Outside of these meetings, um, he was, was a great individual to sit next to at the dinner table. Um, always had some witty observation or humorous story to enliven the discussion. Sir Alistair was a very dear friend and special mentor to me for over 30 years. Most importantly, he showed me how to fight one's corner when it comes to science and regulation with the panache that only a Scottish peer could ever muster. My most endearing memory of Alistair is eating countless meals with him at his London club, the Athenaeum, where numerous luminaries of British science and culture have been members over the centuries. Truly, he ranks right there with them. Working with Sir Alistair has been both a privilege and pleasure. Alistair became a great mentor for me, always sharing his expertise, wisdom, and passion for regulatory science. And as we discussed making core reality, he instilled the notion of excellence in us and reminded us often to never lose sight of that. It was easy to see how invested he was in making the center a reality and success, but always, always pushing us towards excellence. It was my great privilege to have known Alistair from when I was at Singapore's Health Sciences Authority in the early 2000s. His imposing height, his extraordinary intellect, his stern demeanor masking a mischievous dry sense of humor, and his warmth and graciousness made him a wonderful mentor, friend, and role model. The Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecture Series will address and foster dialogue on global biomedical and regulatory issues, challenges, and advances. This will be in keeping with Alistair's commitment to improving international health products regulation and health policy innovation for the benefit of patients, systems, and societies. On behalf of the Breckenridge family, I'd like to say how grateful and honored we are that this prestigious set of lectures is being named after him and how honored he would have been. legacy continues to inspire. Ladies and gentlemen, to further our tribute to the late Professor Sir Alistair Breckenridge, may I now invite Professor John Lim, the founding executive director of CORE, for his welcome address. Professor Lim is also chairman of the Consortium for Clinical Research and Innovation Singapore and a senior advisor at Singapore's Ministry of Health. He is also the policy core lead at the SingHealth Duke NUS Global Health Institute. Professor Lim, please. Thank you, Lavanya. <clears throat> Guest of honor, Professor Kenneth Mark, Director of Medical Services, Ministry of Health, Singapore. Dr. Cheong Wei Yang, Deputy Secretary of Technology, MOH Singapore. Professor Tom Kaufman, Dean of the Duke NUS Medical School. Dr. Penny Heaton, the 2022 Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecturer. Dr. Peggy Hamburg, Chair of the Core Advisory Board, Advisory Board members and all friends and colleagues joining us in person and online in Singapore and around the world today. And of course, our graduating students from the 2021-22 Duke NUS Graduate Certificate in Health Products Regulation Cohort. A very warm welcome to the second Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecture and this year's graduation ceremony. And we're delighted that Professor Mark can join us again and actually be physically engaged more in the ceremony this evening. I would like to especially acknowledge the participation of Dr. Ross Breckenridge, the late Sir Alastair's son, and other family members attending virtually from the United Kingdom. The video you have just watched reminds us again of Professor Sir Alastair Breckenridge's enormous impact on the international community of regulators and regulatory science professionals. In many ways, Alistair is still very much with us. His vision, wisdom, guidance, and personality profoundly impacted so many of us in our organizations and careers over the years, 
that the outworking of his ideas and ideals continues to be demonstrated around the world. Alistair was well recognized and highly respected for his dedication to healthcare, patients, and populations. This was evident throughout his many professional achievements spanning his academic career as professor of clinical pharmacology at the University of Liverpool, his contributions to the World Health Organization and numerous associations, and appointments as inaugural chair of the UK Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, and subsequently of the UK Emerging Science and Bioethics Advisory Committee. Over the years, Alistair paid frequent visits to Singapore and greatly encouraged us in our pursuit of strengthening regulatory excellence across the region. In 2013, I shared the concept of establishing the Duke NUS Center of Regulatory Excellence or CORE with Alistair. He immediately saw the critical need for regulatory training and thought leadership in regulatory policy that CORE could provide in Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. As inaugural chair of CORE's advisory board, Alistair envisioned the center as an influential contributor to regulatory thought leadership and capacity building across the region and at a global level. Today's graduation ceremony for the 2021-22 cohort of CORE's Graduate Certificate in Health Products Regulation Program, the second to be held in conjunction with the Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecture since its inauguration last year, is a testament to the ongoing realization of Alistair's vision. The Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecture Series has a forward-looking perspective on themes of enhancing biomedical innovation, strengthening health systems and regulation, and promoting equitable access to good, safe, and effective health products. This reflects Alistair's commitment to advancing global health products regulation and health policy innovation for the benefit of patients, systems, and societies. Alistair left us before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, but given his extraordinary intellectual capacity, insatiable interest in science and innovation, and his well-appreciated propensity to make pithy, pertinent observations on global health policy developments and challenges, I believe he would have fully supported the initial emphasis on COVID-19 issues in this lecture series named in his honor. As you've heard, the inaugural lecture last year was delivered by Professor Sir Jeremy Farrar, Director of the Wellcome Trust. Sir Jeremy spoke compellingly on the topic of science, innovation, and society to highlight the importance and interconnectedness of these three themes in the context of COVID-19. The video of the lecture and a subsequent publication discussing its themes are accessible on the CORE website. This year, we are privileged and delighted to welcome Dr. Penny Heaton as the second Sir Alistair Breckenridge lecturer. She will deliver the 2022 lecture on the topic of successes and opportunities in the pandemic, revelations from the global COVID-19 response to help us prepare for future pandemics. Penny is a graduate of the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Kentucky. She is board certified in pediatrics and pediatric infectious diseases, a member of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Penny is currently the global therapeutic area head for vaccines at Janssen Research and Development. In this role, she leads a global team focused on developing transformational vaccines to prevent some of the most devastating infectious diseases the world faces today. Penny began her career at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, conducting diarrheal disease surveillance and investigating outbreaks of foodborne and diarrheal diseases. This influenced her lifelong passion for vaccine development. Penny has had two decades of vaccine research and development experience. She recently served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. There, she led the development of investigational products from preclinical through late stage development against multiple diseases, including HIV, TB, malaria, pneumonia, enteric diseases, and polio. 
She has also led vaccine clinical research and development for companies including Novartis, Merck, and Novavax. Notably, during her time at Merck, Penny co-developed a rotavirus vaccine, which has been licensed in more than 100 countries and universally recommended by the WHO for infants worldwide. Given her illustrious background in global health and vaccine development, Penny is certainly most qualified to speak on the topic she has chosen for her lecture today. I'm sure you are as excited as I am to hear Penny's assessment of the global response to COVID-19 and revelations for future pandemic preparedness. It is now my great pleasure to invite Dr. Penny Heaton to deliver the 2022 Sir Alastair Breckenridge Lecture. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you, Professor Lim, so much for that kind introduction and your generous welcome. It's truly an honor to be giving the 2022 Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecture. I have been an avid student of his work beginning in medical school when I first learned of his research on the consequences of drug interference for patients. Professor Breckenridge was prescient of our current situation in co-writing regulatory guidance on bridging the gap between clinical trials and real world effectiveness. As we've struggled to navigate this ongoing pandemic, we have all wished that Sir Breckenridge was with us and have been deeply grateful for the roadmaps that he left behind. I'm also grateful to Sir Breckenridge for mentoring my own public health heroes, including Sir Jeremy Farrar and former US FDA Commissioner Peggy Hanberg, who not only participated in the inaugural lecture last year, but she is here today as well. Their advice and leadership were invaluable when colleagues and I set up the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, or CEPI, in 2017. Who would have imagined the importance it would take on just three years later? I also wish to thank our guest of honor and colleagues from the Ministry of Health, Singapore, Professor Mock and Dr. Wong. And I want to pay tribute to the Duke and US Medical School and the Center for Regulatory Excellence. Dean Kaufman, Professor Lim, and Associate Professor Vogel, and the advisors, the appointees, and visiting experts. I have worked with many of you and can personally attest to the tremendous power and talent at this center. And finally, I want to honor the graduates and current students of CORE, the Sir Alistair Breckenridges of the future. Now let's focus on the topic at hand, successes and opportunities in the pandemic revelations from the global COVID-19 response to help us prepare for future pandemics. I was making dinner on Tuesday evening. It was February 11th, 2020, when I finally said aloud to my husband what I had been thinking for days. We need to stock up on supplies, groceries, canned goods, and water we're going to have a global pandemic. As that reality sunk in, I was afraid. I was afraid for my family. I was afraid for the country. I was afraid for the world. Despite my US CDC training and the epidemics and pandemics that I had previously worked on from avian influenza to SARS, H1N1, MERS, Ebola, Zika, and then back to Ebola again, I knew that I was unprepared. The world was unprepared. Over two years later, COVID-19 has forever changed life as we know it. It has caused unfathomable suffering and mortality and worldwide economic upheaval, the extent of which may haunt us for years. And as you know, it's disproportionately affected the poor, people of color and those living in underdeveloped countries. And just as we seem to be making progress, a new variant emerges we will likely need to monitor and manage this virus for the rest of our lives and prepare for others that are sure to come. Now, the good news is we have had some tremendous success in our battle against COVID-19. And importantly, our struggles and our victories have revealed unparalleled opportunities for what some experts have called post-traumatic growth. I'm hopeful about the future because I know that we have the knowledge, we have the power and the will to save many lives and livelihoods the next time. 
Now, for context, I come at this subject from a global public health perspective, and I view it through an equity lens. I believe passionately that everyone should have the opportunity to lead a healthy and productive life, no matter where they live. In addition, I'm a trained physician with a specialty in pediatric infectious diseases, and I've spent most of my career working on vaccines for infectious diseases. In my current role at Johnson & Johnson, my team and I spend every day analyzing learnings from COVID-19 as we develop strategies for the next generation of vaccines. As the great American poet Maya Angelou once said, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. So let's first talk about success. Clearly the COVID-19 vaccines have been one of our biggest triumphs. The speed of vaccine development, which usually takes decades has been remarkable. The first vaccine that I worked on was rotavirus, the leading cause of diarrheal disease deaths in children. That virus was discovered in 1973 the first generation vaccine was invented in 1981, and it was pre-qualified by the World Health Organization 36 years later in 2009. But it only took 11 months from publishing the COVID-19 genetic sequence to administering that first vaccine dose to a grandmother in the United Kingdom. And additional vaccines followed soon after. This was unprecedented. So how did it happen? Well, first and most importantly, we weren't starting from scratch. Companies, governments, and nonprofits had been investing in messenger RNA or mRNA technology since it was first discovered in the 1960s. And decades of research followed. And by the time COVID-19 began spreading, mRNA vaccines were already being studied for influenza, Zika, yellow fever, rabies, and other viral diseases. The technologies that was used for the AstraZeneca and the J&J &J vaccines, adenovirus vectors, had also been studied for decades. An adenovirus-based vaccine against Ebola has been approved and others evaluated against RSV, HIV, HPV, malaria, and influenza virus. There's also been critical investments in basic coronavirus research. When SARS emerged in 2002 and MERS in 2012, it became clear that coronaviruses could cause epidemics or pandemics. By the time SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 emerged, researchers had been studying coronaviruses for years and vaccines against MERS were being developed. Researchers quickly pivoted identifying the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 as the critical antigen needed to induce protective immune responses against COVID-19, which paved the way for the vaccines. The second thing that enabled the speed of COVID-19 vaccine development was historic support from governments. The US government, for example, invested billions of dollars in RNA, adenoviral vector, or protein subunit vaccines. The UK, India, China, and other large economies also made massive investments into COVID-19 vaccines. And there was unprecedented collaboration among global regulators, including the US FDA, the MHRA in the UK, and EMA in Europe. Professor Breckenridge may have provided us with a North Star in 2013 when he co-authored a paper emphasizing that good drug regulation is not just about minimizing risk, it's also about maximizing public health gains. Never before in our lifetimes have we so desperately needed to get that balance right. Our regulatory agencies identified development activities that could be conducted in parallel without compromising safety. They were collaborative, making their requirements clear to vaccine developers and they worked night and day to shorten review times. Now, it's important to know that the vaccine clinical trials were conducted with the usual scientific rigor and attention to safety. What was different was the size and scope of the global operations. Normally, fewer sites would have enrolled fewer patients over a longer period of time waiting for disease cases to accrue. 
but COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials included hundreds of sites involving hundreds of thousands of people over just a few months. The combination of these massive operations and the virus spreading exponentially gave us sufficient COVID-19 cases to get results much faster. Now, the third reason vaccines went so quickly from sequence to patient was the hugely compressed manufacturing timelines. It typically takes three to five years to build a, manufacturing, a vaccine manufacturing facility and conduct the necessary validation studies. We didn't have that kind of time. So instead, manufacturers scaled up and in some cases built new facilities in record time and began producing vaccine well before completing clinical trials and receiving regulatory approval. This is a business risk for the companies. It's sort of like preparing a banquet for millions, not knowing whether anyone will show up. But all of these efforts that I have described required an, an extraordinary amount of trust, transparency, and collaboration between companies, countries, and groups that would normally compete. And that, for me, has been the biggest lesson of this pandemic trust, transparency, and collaboration. Basically, people doing the right thing for the right reason. That fueled our victories. Unfortunately, sometimes a lack of trust, transparency, and collaboration stymied our progress. I read with interest a study published recently in The Lancet that was conducted by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. The study found that low levels of trust in government and other people strongly correlated to higher COVID infection rates around the world. Conversely, regions with higher levels of trust in government and other people had lower COVID infection rates and higher vaccine coverage. In fact, high levels of trust mattered far more than pandemic preparedness criteria and hospital capacity. These factors, which we would think would drive the illness rates down, had actually very little impact on rates of COVID disease and death. So in terms of doing the right thing, I do want to mention that J&J &J did something notable well before I joined the organization. They took a global approach, specifically designing and developing a one-dose vaccine that was easier to transport and store. It was more convenient to deploy in areas where people have less access to healthcare and areas that couldn't support the shipping and storage requirements of the mRNA vaccines. It was an ambitious and deliberate choice to support global equity in vaccine access, one shot for the world. Now I'd like to discuss how we can respond even better to the next pandemic. As I mentioned, in some regions, a lack of trust, transparency, and collaboration did not serve us well, particularly in the West, like the US and some European countries. Authorities have struggled to communicate effectively to the public about the virus. This was not for a lack of trying. We have to remember what life is like today. The news cycle is instantaneous, 24 seven, requiring constant care and feeding. Almost half of those in the US get their news from social media. And all over the world, we have seen political polarization with tension between so-called personal freedom and the need to protect society from the pandemic. Certainly communication challenges were to be expected in this first in a lifetime crisis. Nevertheless, we have what Professor Sir John Bell from Oxford University has called a moral obligation to learn from our mistakes. Clearly, that will mean becoming much more skilled at transparent messaging to increase public trust and collaboration. It's important to note that Singapore has earned a great deal of praise for its skill in handling the pandemic. It has even been called out as a positive example for the world. Although it was only the third country to report a case of COVID-19, Singapore has suffered far fewer COVID-related deaths than most other countries. Today, it has a high vaccination rate with 88% fully vaccinated. Importantly, Singapore's success has been largely attributed to communication policies 
that built a high level of trust between its citizens and the government. There are three areas of opportunity that I think countries have that have not done as well as Singapore to improve their communication in future pandemics. First, we have to clearly define the goals of vaccine programs. Second, we have to help people understand the iterative nature of science. And third, we must communicate that during an ever evolving pandemic, Policy is subject to change as the virus evolves and research reveals new information. So let's begin with defining the goals of vaccine programs. Now vaccines were praised as the most important tool to end the pandemic, and that is indeed true. But vaccines are not a magic wand to wave and make the pandemic go away. We must explain how vaccines work, what they are able to do and what they are not able to do. Vaccines typically protect against severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths, but they often do not prevent mild illness and are even less likely to prevent asymptomatic infection and transmission to other people. So as far as public health officials were concerned, the COVID-19 vaccines have been miraculously effective at doing what vaccines are supposed to do, reducing the debilitating effects on individuals and the enormous strain on healthcare systems. But some people not as familiar with what to expect have, been, have become disheartened because of breakthrough infections. So rather than returning us to normal life, for them, vaccines have become just one more burdensome pandemic requirement without a guarantee of success. We must be careful to set the right expectations. And that leads me to the second communication opportunity to better explain the iterative nature of science. At least in Western countries, there is a knowledge gap about how science works. And suddenly during the pandemic, that knowledge gap really mattered. Since this coronavirus was novel, we had to learn how it was spread, how to diagnose it, the spectrum of illness that it caused, and how to develop therapeutics to treat and vaccines to prevent it. In science, each study informs the next and may lead to a new conclusion. So studies that found nearly 100% vaccine efficacy against severe COVID demonstrated the importance of vaccination. Follow-on studies that showed efficacy can wane demonstrated that boosters may be needed. Each informed the next. And as such, our public messaging should be, here's what we know now, it's based on the best data we have. And as we get new data, our advice may change. Science is about learning. Many scientists have been trying to communicate that message, of course, but other voices used evolving science to actually engender mistrust between scientists and the public. And unfortunately, there were many opportunities to do this because indeed the message has changed. The bottom line, we must make sure that people understand in a rapidly evolving pandemic, things will change. The final thought that I want to share in communication is this. It must be made extremely clear to the public that as the science evolves, pandemic policies must and will evolve as well. There are many examples of policies changing during this pandemic. In March and April of 2020, we were instructed to wash our grocery items before putting them away. Later, we were told we didn't need to do that. The disease was airborne. Early on, authorities said, don't wear a mask, but later masks became required. Initially, we were told to stay six feet apart, but later when the Delta variant emerged, the guidance changed to 12 feet. This was policy evolving along with the science and the pandemic. And we needed better ways to communicate that as people were confused. So the next time our leaders must find a way to unite against the global crisis. Policymakers must be agile, policy must be flexible, and we must help the public understand when and why that is happening. As the Lancet study I mentioned earlier said, when there is higher government trust and trust in each other, infection rates are lower. I think that is a very clear opportunity for positive change. 
So in addition to opportunities in messaging and communication, the second revelation of the pandemic is this. We must fix vaccine supply and distribution. While we have seen tremendous collaboration in getting the COVID-19 vaccines developed and approved, the collaboration is broken down when it comes to providing access. Essentially, rich countries have gotten more than they needed and poor countries far less. Unfortunately, each nation worked with different companies to make sure their citizens were covered. This hurt rich countries as well as poor ones because an inadequate supply of vaccine in some places, it allows variants to emerge and spread everywhere. Indeed, no one is safe until everyone is safe. A bright spot in this effort to provide vaccines to everyone is COVAX, a program that's been coordinated by Gavi, CEPI, and the World Health Organization to accelerate equitable distribution and access of COVID-19 vaccines around the world. COVAX has shipped nearly a billion and a half doses of vaccine. And yet, fewer than 15% of people in low resource settings have been vaccinated. The potential benefits of rapid vaccine development and production are lost if we can't get them into arms. We want to move rapidly, not just from gene sequence to that UK grandmother's arm, but from gene sequence to all arms. I believe innovations in manufacturing can help. Today, we build huge manufacturing facilities in one or two countries. We fly vaccines all over the world. Some vaccines must be stored in freezers at minus 70 or 80 degrees Celsius, which rural hospitals simply can't achieve. Technology transfers between manufacturers and carefully selected partners have helped. They've been the most practical and effective way to expand global production of COVID-19 vaccines. But what if we reach higher? Can we locally produce vaccines with modular vaccine facilities, which have gone from concept to reality over the last decade? And can we take even a step further and, for example, print vaccines? Breakthroughs supporting benchtop DNA printing and enzymatic synthesis have been progressing. And recently announced is the RNA printer prototype, a transportable downscaled automated mRNA vaccine printing facility. This platform is being designed to provide a rapid supply of formulated mRNA vaccine candidates that can target known and new or unknown pathogens. Think about what this could do, not just for vaccines in a pandemic setting, but also for public health in general. Graduating core class of 21-22, please start thinking about how these would be regulated. Another area that's crying out for innovation is clinical trials. As I mentioned, the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trial designs were similar to those that we've been using for decades. What if it were possible to produce the same quality results with half the trial size and in a shorter time? In just three months after the phase three clinical trials for COVID vaccines started, 100,000 people died of COVID in the US alone. Could we save those lives with shorter recruiting timelines? Could we, for example, use tokenized or real world patients as controls? Is it possible to conduct prospective real world studies and health systems to accelerate enrollment and trial resort? trial results, I think this is an area that is just ripe for innovation. Importantly, whatever innovations we develop and employ, they must be applicable and accessible, not just to a lucky few, but to everyone. Ultimately, we must use cutting edge science and technology to provide human beings all over the world with the tools to live a healthy, happy, and productive life. And so in closing, what has this pandemic revealed? Our greatest successes came from research in areas where we were already investing. So we must keep investing and innovating in other high areas of need, such as clinical trial design and local manufacturing. And we must ensure that innovations in these areas quickly translate into business as usual. 
But remember, innovative technology and science alone are not enough. Trust, transparency, and global collaboration fueled our success and the lack of it stymied our progress. We have learned trust is as important a tool to fight pandemics as diagnostics or therapeutics or vaccines. We must respect it as such. As my mentor once told me, a lesson isn't learned until you decide what you're going to do differently. I am heartened to know that Sir Breckenridge's son, Dr. Ross, is also in the audience today. Clearly, in looking at his path in science and innovation, this is a lesson he learned and a legacy he has carried on from his father. And to the others in the audience today, I want to challenge all of you as future regulators and global citizens to think about what will you do to prepare for the next pandemic? What will your role be in scientific innovation? in communicating to engender trust and collaboration. We can, we must leverage our success and seize the opportunities for positive change. We can meet future pandemics with more sophisticated and accessible science, technology, and messaging. And with your talent, your energy, and your commitment as future regulators and citizens, we will. So to the graduating students and former graduates, the professors, advisors, appointees, and visiting experts, as well as family and friends, thank you all so very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Heaton, for your insights. I would now like to invite Dr. Margaret Hamburg joining us virtually to say a few words. Dr. Hamburg is well known and immensely respected as a former commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, and is the chair of CORE's advisory board. She has also been foreign secretary for the US National Academy of Medicine and chair of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Hamburg chairs the joint coordinating group of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI, and is a board member of Gavi. Dr. Hamburg, please. Well, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be part of this event with so many distinguished guests and colleagues, and to add a few thoughts as we transition from the Alistair Breckenridge lecture to our graduation ceremony. And let me first begin by thanking you, Dr. Heaton Penny, uh, for those truly wonderful remarks, so eloquent, thoughtful, informative, and inspiring. Your leadership in biomedical research and product innovation has made such a difference in the world, and today more than ever. As you could tell from her remarks, Penny is a remarkable individual who's committed her professional life to efforts to harness science in the service of society. I've long admired Penny for her many contributions to global health and have had the great good fortune to consider her both a friend and a colleague. And she's also been a teacher. Few understand the complex process of vaccine research and development, as does Penny. Her work on rotavirus vaccines, group B strep, meningococcal vaccine, and now COVID vaccine are all testimonials to that fact. But her insights, as you heard, into the entire biomedical product innovation ecosystem and the context for both vaccine development and their use are equally consequential. She has worked hard to identify and address unmet public health and medical care needs, whether in industry, uh, government service, or through her work at the Gates Foundation. She's helped us all think about how best to shape the kinds of scientific investments in biomedical research and development activities that are needed, and importantly, how best to align opportunities to advance science and innovation with opportunities to advance the health of people, especially for the most vulnerable. Few understand as she does what's required to actually translate a good idea or new scientific technology into a real world product, a product for which the right studies are done to assess safety and efficacy as swiftly 
and robustly as possible, enabling the appropriate balancing of risks and benefits. A product that can be scaled up and manufactured reliable, reliably with full maintenance of quality and performance. A product that can be used appropriately with trust and confidence by those in need and a product that can make a real and enduring, enduring difference for public health. This is such important work. And it's the kind of activity and understanding that CORE, the Center of Regulatory Excellence, has been advancing from the very beginning. And it was the vision that Sir Alistair Breckenridge brought to both his storied career and of course, his work with CORE. Sir Alistair Breckenridge was committed to science, innovation and society. As you heard in the commemorative video, he was passionate about clinical pharmacology, but not just as an academic area of study, but rather how to use that science, to develop new innovative medical products and how to better use available products. His dedication towards healthcare, patients and populations was profound. And he was determined that the best possible science be used to inform decisions and improve health. Not surprisingly, he brought that perspective, knowledge and experience to core, along with his passion and his tireless energy, serving as the founding chair of the advisory board. From the outset, he offered a vision that has defined the unique position of core as an influential contributor to regulatory thought leadership and capacity building in the Asia Pacific region and increasingly at a global level. During his tenure, Sir Alistair played a key role in the formation and implementation of the strategic objectives for CORE, Asia's first center for regulatory excellence, but in fact, the first center like it anywhere in the world. His leadership and guidance enabled the center to successfully develop and grow, serving governments, industry, and academia. And acting as a training center, a work collaborative, and a think tank, CORE, continues to make a real and lasting difference. The center has an outstanding team, an amazing leadership in John Lim, CORE's brilliant executive director and his outstanding deputy, Silke Vogel. Together, they've created this now thriving hub of activity, building competencies, enhancing collaboration and promoting new thinking and new leadership in regulatory science and policy. And without a doubt, the enterprising and innovative work of CORE has been indelibly imprinted with the wisdom, irrepressible enthusiasm and advocacy of one Sir Alistair Breckenridge. So it's exciting and appropriate that we recognize this truly remarkable man and continue his mission, not just with a lecture series in his name, but also with the Alistair Breckenridge Fund. The fund enables CORE to expand learning opportunities, strengthen and extend regulatory capacity building, and further encourage and support collaboration. Significantly, the fund enables study awards to health professionals from national regulatory authorities, ministries of health, and related organizations from the ASEAN and Asia Pacific region to enroll in courses run by CORE, offsetting the course fees, travel expenses, and accommodation costs of participants. It's hard to overstate just how much this kind of professional development and regulatory capacity building really matters. And frankly, the work of CORE has never been more relevant more vital to the health, safety, productivity, and well being of people in Singapore, the Southeast Asia region, and beyond. As Penny's remarks so forcefully remind us, if we're truly going to deliver on the power of science and innovation for the betterment of all, enabling a world where everyone has access to good, safe, and effective health products we must recognize the unique and essential role of regulatory science and smart, responsible regulatory oversight. This is true whether addressing the pressing threat of the COVID-19 pandemic or other potential threats of that catastrophic nature, 
but also the continuing burden of infectious and chronic diseases that all nations face. But the mission goes much further because it's not sufficient to simply focus on advancing regulatory science and practice, but that work must become integral to broader efforts to strengthen health systems overall. But the path ahead is not easy. In the Asia Pacific region, as in others, challenges uh, exist, including the underdevelopment and fragmentation of both health systems and regulatory systems in and across nations, insufficient education and training opportunities, lack of capacity and suitable mechanisms for regulatory science and policy development, and perhaps most fundamentally, limited awareness of and support for the importance of regulatory science and regulatory issues that underpin our ability to really offer the kinds of safe, effective and available products that the world and its people so much need. Thankfully, CORE is well positioned and actively engaged on all of these fronts, contributing to these areas as a neutral but highly respected and expert academic platform for capacity building, enhanced collaboration and thought leadership in advancing regulatory science and policy. The Alistair Breckenridge Fund is designed to help to realize these critical goals. So for those who can, I hope that you'll help honor the legacy and hopes of a great man, Sir Alistair Breckenridge, and support the vital work of CORE by giving to the Alistair Breckenridge Fund. This is a worthy investment. Your support will promote excellence in regulatory sciences and practices to safeguard health and well being and promote public health. Your support will advance cross border knowledge exchange, regulatory capacity building, and ongoing training as participants from diverse backgrounds collaborate and learn together. And perhaps most significantly, your support will help to build the future, enabling up and coming regulatory health and, uh, and regulatory uh, professionals to access educational networks, build new understandings and new networks of expertise. What is more important than ensuring that we have the dedicated and well-trained professionals to face the challenges before us? So on that note, it's now time for our event's capstone, the graduation ceremony for a group of outstanding core trainees, a very exciting moment. So with congratulations and good wishes to those who are graduating, I turn back to Lavanya to introduce the graduation segment of today's program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamburg. If you would like to find out more about the CORE campaign, please scan the QR code shown on the screen or click on the web page link that's provided in the Zoom chat function for more information on how to donate. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving on to the CORE graduation ceremony for our graduate certificate in health products regulation. To commence today's graduation ceremony, we are very pleased to present a video of our graduates' fond memories on their learning journey the experience with our esteemed faculty and how the program has added value to their career development and personal goals. esteemed guests of honours, speakers, faculty and fellow graduates. I started my journey with CORE to complete modules as part of the master's program with NUS. But not knowing what to expect, I came to experience that the initial modules were intensive, yet enriching in the manner of content and delivery. Learning journey with CORE has been most enjoyable and rewarding. Fellow graduates would agree with me that packing a whole level 5,000 postgrad module in a single week has been most intense and multiplied by four. 
But this is also what makes this program most efficient and suitable for the busy executive. I believe in continuous self-improvement and learning. As such, I try to keep abreast with the latest developments in the pharmaceutical industry, as well as trends and developments generally. This course helped me do that. With two decades of vibrant experience in the field of regulatory compliance for pharmaceuticals and biopharmaceutical products, I was looking for a program which cannot just reinforce my learning so far, but give me the future perspective. I was looking for an institute which can offer me a whole new way to look at the regulatory compliance where I can leverage my knowledge and expertise for the common good of a global community. The Duke NUS emerged as the answer. When I received news that I would be enrolled in a postgraduate certificate program as one of the ASEAN regulators awarded with the scholarship by the Duke Core NES, I was very happy but nervous as I never imagined how studying while working would be like. But the program was designed in such a smart way that it has enabled me to work and study at the same time. I learned a lot during the course, things that I never knew I'm still lacking even with my years of experience. Learning with other course mates ranging from the industry, academia, and other regulators has given me a broader insight into regulatory matters from different angles and perspectives. This program not only focuses on lectures, we also need to solve the real-life case study or issue during practicum. We need to apply what we have learned, think critically, and discuss among our team members to come up with the solutions for the case. This session helps us to understand the topic better. Overall, this program has increased my regulatory knowledge and improved my decision-making skill at work. I also found that the interactive learning through practicums and panel discussions were most valuable and industry relevant. This program has helped me gain a better appreciation and application of regulatory frameworks in my area of work, as well as growing my network. It's especially relevant to working professionals in the industry as the faculty comprise not just of academics, but also fellow working professionals and regulators from the various national agencies. The faculty is amazing. They are competent, knowledgeable, approachable, friendly, and are always so helpful in giving constructive guidance and assistance. The speakers are from different backgrounds, and the sharing of their knowledge and experiences during the workshop taught me the importance of looking things from various perspectives, not only from regulatory point of view. The most relevant topics, panel of global experts, and an excellent cohort made this journey an incredible collaborative learning experience. The entire course vibrated the spirit of making regulatory compliance an enabler for public health care, which is need of an hour. Goa's experience and committed to education and helping its students leapfrog on the experiences of both world-class regulators and veterans in select fields. This is evident when you see the effort that goes behind the carefully curated program to the competing speakers invited to share as faculties. Personally, it was fun going back to school with old friends and meeting new ones. One thing I'll surely miss will be when we corner faculties in friendly debates and how we'll always end up with more possibilities than we did before. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the faculty at CORE and my fellow course mates. Here's to wishing everyone all the best. Thank you CORE for offering this program with a curriculum which includes the regulatory requirements and challenges in ASEAN countries. I would like to express my sincerest thanks to the CORE Duke NES in rewarding me with the opportunity and has further equipped me to become a better regulatory pharmacist. I hope to see Duke Core NES continue their strive in producing competent regulators from various backgrounds and fields of work in many more years to come. I hope to be able to put to use what I've learned to make a positive change in my community, participate actively in helping to shape the ethical landscape of the pharmaceutical industry, as well as to volunteer with ethics committees. Thank you. COVID stopped the world momentarily, but at Duke and US, together we kept moving. With digital meetings, with, with the seminars, with the programs, moving towards more rational, more scientific, more efficient way to implement regulatory compliance in such a way that it creates an ecosystem where everything is enabling better public health care globally. We never grow old if we continue learning and bombarding our brains with new information and ideas. So I wish all of us in the pursuit of new knowledge each day, everlasting youth. Stay young and stay safe. And happy graduation, everyone.
Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed the video. May I please invite on stage the graduation party, which includes Professor Kenneth Mark, Director of Medical Services, Ministry of Health Singapore, Professor Thomas Kaufman, D. Duke NAS Medical School, Professor Silke Vogel, Deputy Director Kaur, and Dr. Rati Saravanan, Lead Education Associate. Congratulations to the graduating cohort for having fulfilled the requirements and attained the graduate certificate in Health for Arts Regulation. As I read out your name, please proceed to the stage to receive your certificate from the Director of Medical Services, Professor Kenneth Mark, and a gift from the Dean of Duke NUS Medical School, Professor Thomas Kaufman. Ms. Roshni Balram. Ms. Marian Chan Mayin. Ms. Tina Jialing Chen. Ms. Chen E in Mr. Chu Guanji Andy. Ms. Huang Zili. Ms. Lan Yenning. Mr. Lee Chin Xiong. Mr. Andrew Lee Ang Ten. Ms. Ong Chi Lin. <laughs> Dr. Ong Chi Ying Eugenia. Mr. Benjamin Petrana. Ms. Seng Mui Tiang.
Miss Sosi M. Karina. Miss Tan Lee Kyung. Miss Tae Eng Yu. Miss Wang Yi Song. Miss Wang Si Xian. Mr. Wong Sowe. Miss Yip Ying Wei Sherry. We have now completed the segment for the graduates who have joined us in the auditorium. Thank you, Professor Mark and Dean Kaufman. May I request you to take your seats? Please also extend your congratulations to the following graduates who are not in attendance with us in the auditorium today, but are joining us virtually. Mrs. Do Hong Nok, Mr. Go Siong Peng Ruben, Ms. Heng She In, Ms. Deborah Giam Kandia, Ms. Ko Weiling Priscilla, Mr. Charles Lu, Mr. Oi Siong Hui Marcus, Ms. Kelly Pang Chia Singh, Ms. Ten Ye Un Emilia, Mr. Mohammad Yusuf. In our commitment to build, build regulatory capabilities in Asia Pacific, Ko and our partners have provided education grants and scholarships to support deserving individuals for this graduate certificate program. This has also been made possible in part by your financial support and contributions. Now, we are delighted to present our study award recipients who are graduating today. Ms. Arlind Joanne Aprila, Indonesia. Mr. Nirav Choksi, India. Ms. Gao Jingjing, China. Ms. Pitsuda, Lao, PDR. Ms. Ellis Mohammed, Brunei. Ms. Ng Pei Ling, Malaysia, Mr. Kong Chak, Lao Pedia, Ms. Sia Hongde, China. Once again, hearty congratulations to our graduates and, my, and may you continue to pursue this journey of professional development and learning. May I now invite the Deputy Director of Corps, Professor Silke Ogel, for her closing remarks. Thanks, Rati. Um, once again, congratulations to our graduating class on the successful completion of the Graduate Certificate in Health Product Regulation. Congrats. Being the third cohort to walk across the stage today, we have reached another milestone, and we have now graduated a total of 80 students from CORE. CORE appreciates all of you who have contributed to our successes through the years. This has been an extraordinary evening, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to continue to remember Sir Alistair, and with that, his vision for our center. As evident as evidence tonight, his legacy continues to shine through much of our work. We also thank Dr. Penny Heaton for readily agreeing to be our second esteemed lecturer today. It was inspiring to hear to emphasize, uh, emphasize 
who emphasize the key lessons learned from the last two years that can determine success. This includes not only the importance of long-term investments in science, but also the significance to establish trust, transparency, and collaboration. As CORE is entering its eighth year, we continue to enable access to health products through fostering our own collaborations and trust among key stakeholders from government, academia, foundations, and industry on our neutral academic platform. We aim, we aim to work together on forward-thinking education and policy initiatives, including tackling regulatory policy questions in areas of digital health and AI, innov innovative therapies, as well as continuing to strongly support capacity building for good regulatory practices, practices in the region and beyond. I also very much echo, echo Peggy's thoughts, which she so passionately shared in her speech. Consider supporting CORE through a donation via our CORE campaign, hashtag thanks to you. This will enable us to continue making an impact. So please visit our website, scan our QR code for more information. And with this, we conclude the live stream of this event. And again, thanks to all of you in Singapore and abroad who attended our second lecture series in graduation today. And congrats again, and stay well. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Vogel. We will now move into the final segment for this evening. And may I please request for all of you to remain seated for the next five minutes while we take a group photograph with our graduating cohort. May we request Professor Mark, Dean Kaufman, and Professor Lim to join Professor Vogel on stage for a group photograph, please. Thank you, Professor Mark and Dean Kaufman, for being part of our graduation ceremony. May we invite you to take your seats, please. Thank you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the evening. Thank you to each and every one of you for joining us at the 2022 Sir Alistair Breckenridge Lecture. We hope you've enjoyed the program over the course of this evening. And for our graduates, we hope you continue to be a part of our CORE alumni journey and we welcome you to join CORE's future events. Thank you all and have a pleasant evening.